This is Back to Back. Yo, what's up, Back to Backers? This is Willie Joy. Welcome to the show. This is Back to Back. This is my podcast. Uh, Well, guys... I did it again. I don't know what's wrong with me. I didn't learn, but here I am back in Las Vegas, sweating my ass off, sitting in a car that we just turned off so I could record this intro. I did this once about a month ago. If you heard the episode, you already heard me bitching about it. I just don't learn. I don't know what's wrong with me. I need help. But hey, here we are. I hope everybody out there is doing well. I hope you had a good week. I hope you're feeling strong, happy, excited, relaxed. You know, however you want to be feeling. That's what I hope for you. But no matter how you are right now, I think you're going to be a little better once we get done today. I've got Feed Me on the show. Such a lovely guy. You know, earlier this year, Feed Me released the High Street Creeps album which is an incredible body of work. Uh, You know, really every Feed Me album is worth a listen. It's worth your time. Uh, But I just love this one. And of course, I'm not the only one. I mean, it's got millions of streams, huge support all over the world. And he just finished up his U.S. tour. He brought back the full live Teeth show, which I think at one point was retired. I don't know that anyone thought that was coming back. If you haven't seen it before, uh, it's a really incredible show. Cross your fingers that he brings it out again soon. But uh, yeah, that last tour was amazing. All over the country, huge venues, sold out shows. And right now he's back in the studio working on more new music, a lot of exciting new projects to come. And we're going to talk a lot more about all of that in just a second. But before we do, Back to Back is brought to you today by Serato. I don't know where the modern DJ world would be without Serato, had Serato not existed. And what's crazy is they are still going strong. They just released Serato Studio, which for all my producers out there, you need to go check this out. Serato Studio is a new beat making software that helps simplify the path to music production. This is for you because it places creativity at the heart of the software so you can spend more time just making music and less time hitting technical roadblocks, getting frustrated. They've really simplified the process. Process. And even if you're an advanced producer, it has a ton of extra features for you. There's features like the master key change function where you can transpose the key of an entire project, not just a sample, not just a track, but your entire project. You can change the key with just one click and you can export stems really easily out of Serato Studio into whatever DAW you're comfortable in. It comes built in with lots of free samples, instruments, loops, drums, and a effects. You can get started right away. And right now there is a free 14 day trial available to everyone. So all you have to do is go to www.serato.com slash studio. Get the software now. Try it fully functional for free for 14 days. So go check it out. Serato Studio at www.serato.com slash studio. So I've only got a little time uh, while I sit baking in this car, feeling like an idiot, in between a couple things I'm doing out here in Vegas. So I'm going to keep this brief. As always, don't forget to subscribe to this show. Don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts if you're listening there. But more than anything else, if you want to help us out, if you want to help support this show so I can keep giving you guys awesome free episodes every single week, the best way you can do that is just by helping me spread the word about Back to Back. I've been getting tons of people tagging me in their story, tagging the show. I've been seeing lots of tweets go up in the last couple weeks. And all of that is great, not only because it helps the show grow, but also I get to meet all of you guys. We get to interact and connect. I have so much fun doing that. I'm always replying, reposting, just interacting with you guys. It's so much fun. So shout out to everybody out there supporting. 
And if you want to get involved, don't forget, my name is at Willie Joy on all social media, and the show is at Back to Back Pod. I'm here for you, too. You can always reach out to me, backtobackpod at gmail.com is the email address. I'm here if you have any questions, any thoughts about the show, comments, concerns, ideas for future guests. Hit me up. I'm here for you. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about today's show. So, meeting up with Feed Me, uh, we actually met up, uh, weirdly, in Las Vegas the last time I was here. It's about a month ago. Uh, Feed Me was on his North American tour that I mentioned earlier. Uh, We met up at the House of Blues here in Vegas, went back to uh, one of the offices back there. And yeah, I had been looking forward to this one. I love Feed Me's music. We have a lot of mutual friends. As a producer, I mean, he's so widely respected by the community. You know, he's such a forward thinking producer, but we had never met. I didn't know him. I didn't know what to expect. And uh, man, he couldn't have been more lovely. I love episodes where people are just game down to get into it. Uh, One thing, I don't think I've ever actually said this, but usually what happens before I hit record is I have a line that I tell every single guest and I say, don't think of this as an interview. Think of this more as a conversation. And that's really what this felt like. I think you can really hear us uh, just enjoying each other's company, having a blast. And I just think it's a rare talk with a rare talent. And like I said, Feed Me's new album, High Street Creeps, is out right now. You got to go check it out if you you haven't heard it already. And don't forget to keep up with him. You don't want to miss out when new music comes out the next time he's going to come to your city. I'm going to put a link in the description of this episode where you can go check out everything Feed Me. So that's it. I've been talking for like eight minutes and I'm already sweating my ass off in this car. I hate myself. This was a terrible idea, but I love this episode. Big shout out to Feed Me. Let's get into it right now. This is me and Feed Me. Back to back. Let's go. Yeah, man. Uh, Vegas. <laughs> um, we were talking before we started rolling. Uh, this is a strange place. We're, we're dealing with the effects of being here already. <laughs> well, as you said, it's because we shouldn't be here at all. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and even for you playing a show here, I mean, I think we talked about it for a second when I first met you, like, it, it's just an odd thing because Vegas is such its own world, right? I, I don't know. Does it feel different to you as a performer? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I did a season at, Encore. Oh, you did like a residency for... I did. I think when they booked it, I'm not sure they'd ever heard my music or anything. Right. It was just sort of an experiment. I was one of a range of people doing that residency at Excess and uh, Beach Club, some of which was really memorable and enjoyable, and some of which (laughs) it instilled a lot of like... Existential dread. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When when it's you're just playing the people who came here for a convention and <laughs> yeah, but the, 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 the whole way through the experience, from the moment you're picked up to uh, sent on stage, and it's a little surreal, right? Yeah, there's a certain transparency to a lot of people out here because of the transient and transparent nature of the why everyone's here in the first place <laughs> so yeah I, I found it it was interesting it was character building did you change your show to play like a vegas show no absolutely not <laughs> no, I, I think that was part of the problem right I, I came into doing that not as a particularly experienced house dj or anything like that i had my project, which was my new project. And the reason I'd started that project is because I could do whatever I wanted. I hadn't really considered the idea that I would be immediately put into an environment where I would be sort of expected to play a specific thing to an order, a specific audience. Right. It wasn't on my uh, resume, yeah, 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 so yeah. to speak. And they didn't really talk about it much with you beforehand either? I got like, I think by the second or show, third show, a sort of... Uh, I don't know if friendly is the word, but like some, maybe some polite guidance about yeah. what I should be doing. But <laughs> some constructive criticism. Yeah, veiled. Yeah. <laughs> it was sort of, the politeness was sort of a veil. I, I think yeah. they were just like, what are you doing? 
what have we done by booking you? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it, it's strange. Sometimes it worked though. I right. mean, I, I had like my show. I wanted to play my stuff. That's why I'd started the project. Uh, as far as I was concerned at the time, it was their fault for booking me. Yeah. I was yeah. going to do my thing and they could always tell me to stop. Right. Which they didn't. <laughs> so I, I think I finished before the very end of the season. I just, I'd been on tour a lot at that point. I was, I was taking, I took every show mm. I possibly could basically to finance the beginnings of, of what I'm touring here now. Well, because you started off when the Feed Me project started, I mean, you know, we just walked by the stage with the giant teeth set up, uh, you know, so much money and manpower and all that must go into a show like that. And when you started the project, I mean, it kind of started off at that high conceptual level, right? Yeah. That uh, Yeah, that must have been hard right off the bat, just what you were saying, even getting the money to put a show together. Yeah, like well, I, I suppose we fronted that money with money from shows, yeah. prospective shows, and then off, that offset... I think I'm pretty sure Dead Mouse lent me some of that money oh, through yeah. Mousetrap. So it put a, a certain amount of pressure on the situation because it had to work. <laughs> right, because now you had to actually pay people back. And yes. <laughs> and also just, you know, I'd spent so many years sort of dreaming of being able to extend a project into something multi-sensory uh, and three-dimensional. And finally having got people who sat in a room with me and took me seriously about these ideas was you know, immediately exciting. And then, but at a certain point, you sort of left on your own and you think, oh, shit, I hope <laughs> it's better work. Because uh, <laughs> all these, it's weird when you, you're used to sort of f throwing these ideas out and people are like, nah, piss off, man. Right. Like, that's unrealistic, isn't it? Yeah. Get your head out of your ass. But uh, when everyone's like, we can make that work, that's a good idea. You're like, mm. <laughs> right. It, it, for me, it, it's this weird chip on my shoulder kind of thing because I'm I'm used to that too of sort of being like really nobody else sees this like I think this is pretty cool nobody nobody and then when you actually get somebody to take a bite on it th at least in my mind then it's like my ego flips and then I'm like uh, I don't know like <laughs> yeah I, I, I it's a weird thing like as soon as somebody else starts believing it I get more nervous about it I think it, I was so driven at that point to I, it was the apprehension was about whether it was going to be sustainable mm. as a thing to do, like where, or whether I was just going to tank a lot of money. <laughs> but I never did it to earn money, right? It's, and it's it's not an earning thing. If I wanted to earn money, I'd do what I think a lot of my peers have done over the years, which is book a live tour and do the bare minimum and bring a big projection screen or. It's an LED wall and call yeah. it a day and you can you can clean up as long as you can sell the tickets. Oh, a hundred percent. Or, you know, you take this rig out for a month and then for the rest of the year you do, you know, feed me DJ set. Right? Well, I do that anyway. I, I, mean, I know I you do, to. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I gotta draw the line. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like DJing still too, but to me to, for DJing to be rewarding, I like to have something like this going on as well. Mm. I, I, otherwise I don't want my musical project defined by just going around with my USB stick. Right. I find it a little bit soul destroying after a while. <laughs> but to be able to say this is this is the culmination of my efforts sort of assembled into an object that you can experience and have that as the pinnacle. And then also to be able to say, also I like other people's music and if you would like me to, to play that to you in a fun environment, I will do that too. <laughs> Great pitch for DJing. Right yeah. There. yeah. <laughs> well, that's what it is, isn't it? Oh, I, absolutely. I, I also think that's part of this is creating a differentiation between that. I like playing clubs where I'm not the center of attention. Mm. I think there's this weird like Messiah complex to a lot yeah. of the, the extreme end of EDM. Where it's, is that how you came up? Like going to clubs where the DJ wasn't the center of attention? Yeah, I suppose. Or at least he was hard to see. Right. Or yeah. He or she was hard to see. But looking at them wasn't particularly interesting. Like, right. I wanted to see what they were playing. Sure. When I started going to clubs, I wanted to see what was written on the white labels because mm. I was the sort of geek I was. You know, right, I wanted right. to know what was coming next and who was, who made it. And there's the, the drum and bass days, right? Yeah. 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 Which, 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 you know, is strongly linked with. Um, some people might know, but it was always strongly linked with like a dub plate culture, getting unreleased records cut to limited use final yeah and it was a, a secret club sort of thing where if you were cool enough you would get those records handed out to you, you know, in good time and there's certain DJs still at the top of that scene who are 
maintaining that position. Yeah, I mean, the dub plate culture is so interesting because, I mean, there's nothing else like it. And certainly it goes a long way into the fabric of what drum and bass music is, right? Like, you, I, I don't think you could have drum and bass without that kind of ideal. But then... I also feel like it's held back the the scene as a whole for drum and bass, if you know what I mean. Like, like I feel like it got so competitive at a certain point. And this is just from an outside observer. I'm very much an outside observer now, so I, I couldn't offer too much yeah. contemporary perspective. I Now drum and bass to me is, it brings back like fond nostalgic memories mm. and... I can't help but be sort of infected by it. If I walk into a club and it's playing and yeah. I I find myself sort of slowly getting pulled in. And I really enjoy it. It's, <laughs> oh, I love it too, man. Yeah, I, I actually did a, like every now and again, I do do uh, a drum and bass booking. I did one in Rotterdam in uh, the Netherlands just recently. As Spore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh it was it was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet it was. <laughs> yeah. I, at this point, is that what that is for you? Just sort of an outlet to go have fun, like clear your head, do something else for a minute? Yes, because I think it's sort of in line with what you might have been hinting at a minute ago, it is a very competitive industry. Um, it's, I mean, a lot of the same names. Uh, I went and did the show and the, the lineup, I knew all of them. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like a little class reunion yeah that's actually i never thought about that but i don't know a lot of like i'm sure there are a lot but i don't really know like the new up-and-coming hot drum and bass producers there's plenty of very talented people doing it I, and, and it's consistently represented the sort of higher skilled end, end of engineering i think oh absolutely it's yeah just, it's purely because you have less time in order to make things work because everything is closer together. <laughs> because uh, of the high tempo, yeah. yeah um, that, that's always going to bring its own challenges. And, and it's such a technical style of music too. There's something about, you know, the fact that it's, that it's breakbeat and that, you know, it doesn't necessarily, like house music, you know, there's a certain structure, right? That at its base level, everyone is going to follow. You know, there's the kick drum, you know how it's going to sound, but drum and bass... I mean, I guess you could argue it also has a core rhythmic structure, but to me, it's a little more open in terms of, you know, if you have some crazy idea, you can sort of just go in there and try to make it work. Yeah, I would, I would say so. It's, it's, it's a fun platform to work in. It's, it's like an open book. Uh, I, I, a lot of it to me is also psycho, psychoacoustic, like having transients very close to each other. Hmm. You, you need to be more careful about how a kick drum is differentiated from a snare because if the time between them means you're more likely to sort of... That's interesting. So it's... it's things like that. Yeah, um, more like a, a more complicated puzzle. Absolutely. Like yeah, I, it, when I started doing Femi stuff, it, it was just kicking the rule book out of the window in a different way because it was anti-engineered, if anything. I didn't want to... I enjoyed just making aggressive sort of attention-grabbing sounds, um, working in a sort of non, non-sort non of ADD way about about how precise I was being, non, mm. just non-precision, I suppose. Well, I can, I can imagine, man. And I, I want to talk about sort of that transition from project to project. But before we even get there, uh, you know, we mentioned earlier your early experiences going into clubs, sort of train spotting DJs, all of that. For anyone who doesn't know, this was taking place in the UK, right? Yes. And yeah. what part of the UK are you from? Uh, I was born in, I guess, North London. Um, and I've grown up in Hertfordshire, which is a county immediately above London. Okay. So is uh, that... So above, uh, sort of north of London. North, north. Yeah, yeah. not literally like uh, Elysium <laughs> or something. But uh, Would that be considered like a, a suburb or like is that its own kind of little it's town? It's outside Greater London. Okay. So uh, it's its own county. Uh, yeah. I went to school in East Hearts and now I live in West. Okay. Uh, to me, it sort of represents a border between... You get a lot of commuters who still get collect fast trains in at the city it represents a sort of border between english countryside and and the metropolitan area mm, so you get a little bit of both yeah which yeah. is my preference yeah i can i can understand that Did, was it a fun place to grow up no <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was it was fine I, I wasn't a massively social kid okay and I, I i can't answer whether i would have had a more fun childhood <laughs> in a different location yeah yeah it's sort of because going outside a lot 
didn't interest me and socializing a lot and not so much either. So what did interest you? Computers. Okay. Yeah. And creativity and stuff. I've always been happy with my own company and I struggle to have anything in common or, or identify with people that don't have hobbies. A hundred percent. Okay. Well, this is, I, I have to take a little sidebar for a second because I talk about this on the show all the time. I'm a huge supporter of hobbies in general. What are your hobbies? Uh, right now, my biggest hobby is, I've rediscovered this in the last couple of years, playing Dungeons and Dragons. Nice. Like board game? Yeah, Dungeons like board from. game, but even even beyond board game, it's like a uh, like role-playing game, you know? So it's like intense character sheets with tons of tiny attributes that are all dependent on each other. And nice. I used to listen to my friend's parents do that. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. We, when I was very small, they would play and they'd be sort of babysitting me and my sister sometimes. Ah, oh, that's and fun. I remember listening to, it was interesting listening to adults like become characters. Right. In a home environment. <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. It, would you ever participate? Not then. Actually, I, I recently played um, Flux Pavilion. Is like very much into his board games. and. Oh, yeah. Warhammer and all sorts, oh, anything, yeah. anything in between, really. Right, right, right. And uh, a bunch of us in, we were in LA at the same time recently. We worked on some music and we also did some sort of role playing card uh, game thing that he brought with him, which took me a while to learn. Right. <laughs> but uh, it was actually, it was fun. I can see, I think most people have a sort of mental barrier preventing them from that sort of thing. And then it, it takes a certain amount of effort to overcome the introduction and the, yes. the induction and yes. then the induction period and then suddenly you're immersed in it. Oh, so it was great. Yeah, yeah. It's super. I, I think a big part of it is, like you said, you have to have the right group of people. It helps to have, you know, trusted friends or just people. Do you play kind of, with like a regular I Yeah, I try group. to as much as I'm able to with travel and all that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a couple times a month, hopefully. Nice. Yeah, man. Anything else? I exercise i don't know if that counts as a hobby but like i'm a i'm a gym rat unfortunately i think it does yes <laughs> not many kind people do exercise well, yeah. it's sort of a sad hobby i guess <laughs> but it is a hobby <laughs> yeah you you look like maybe you share that hobby uh only recently to be honest is that right yeah i like historically i think when i was like early 20s i went through like a sort of phase of being really into working out and uh, i had like a punch bag and I'd go to the gym pretty much every day. Yeah. I suppose in recent years, I've just been trying to redefine sort of how I live. Um, so this year I changed how I ate. I stopped drinking. Mm. And that in turn got me interested in exercise again. Sure. Uh, in a different way than when I was younger though. I'd, I've been a bit more scientific about it this time and it's been much easier and more rewarding as a result. Mm. So I, I'm sort of angry at myself for not <laughs> being more careful before. Yeah. Thanks I, for the compliment, though. No, 100%, man. Yeah. You're oh, yeah, looking you look good. Like you, yeah. you can say as many things as you like. Right, eh? <laughs> well, how did the, the no drinking thing come about? Like, what brought you to the, that decision? I've been drinking since I was about 15. Yeah. And in the UK, uh, especially when I was that age. I mean, that's just kind of standard, right? Yes. Yeah, my friend, like... We'd like buy the bartender at the local rugby club a pint and then he would just turn a blind eye to serving us all night. Right. We were all about, we could barely see over the bar. <laughs> at the time, I thought I was walking in and I was like, yeah, of course I'm 18. Right. <laughs> like in my shirt, my Ben Sherman shirt and shoes, <laughs> you know, as if that, like, I didn't look 18 when I was 25. So right. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. But uh, yeah, yeah, so it, to me, it was as such a shy person alcohol became a way of of being able to be in social environments and was probably a huge help in my career because there's a lot of things i don't think i would have been able to as uh, it's yeah. sort of painful to admit but it would have been very difficult especially like at that vegas residency was a good example I'd, at, the, at certain points in that i was extremely close to leaving on my own accord mm. before the show even happened just out of uh worry concern about why I was there and, and whether I was, whether it was important for me to be accepted or whether, just, just a lot of internal head, conflict. Yeah. And 
uh, having a few drinks is a good way of just sort of numbing that. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think about that too, especially in the early days. So many of those relationships that end up becoming important business relationships, often they're forged just by like partying with someone for a night, right? right? Social lubricant. Yeah, I was the same way, man, because I, I never felt like I was that guy who could just go out and entertain somebody for a night by myself, you know? It's it got me in a lot of trouble over the years. <laughs> also, I've had a lot of fun drinking. <laughs> I, I mean, I discovered I, I like playing up. So if, yeah, I, yeah. if I'm drunk, I want to do something like yeah. a stunt or. I mean, you had a bit of a reputation for a little bit, right? Thank you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know from personal experience, but I just feel like that's that's something I know about you, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I suppose so. I'm not sure if I'm proud of it or not. <laughs> that's, that's fine. <laughs> it's fun to tell stories like that, though, I suppose. I, I don't really have an awful lot of regrets about any of this situation. I, I, it's um, a continuous learning experience, having been fortunate enough to have this career and and meet lots of really important people in my life as a result of it and, you know, manifest creative ideas in ways I never thought would be possible, like this show. You know, being able to drink and and be out and be social um, has been a huge help in that, and and has benefited my life yeah. greatly. Now, I'm trying to see. I, I always want to be challenged, and doing everything without the help of alcohol has been its own. Yeah, how has it been? Does it feel odd to yes. sort of do the things you've been doing for ten years, but just with the the one thing eliminated? Yeah, it do, it is learning to you know, carry myself to sort of stay on top of my self-consciousness or uh, also perform, mm. you know, in a new way. It's And I suppose from the observer's point of view, it doesn't look at me a huge amount different uh, at all. <laughs> right. It's just internal. But it probably feels totally different, right? Yeah. I've discovered slowly after a little adjustment period that I much prefer it and, and I'm doing a, a better job and feeling more rewarded as a result yeah so, do you find you can be in the moment a little bit more once you once you sort of get over the nerves part of it perhaps lucid I, i've always been very much focused on lucidity i think just in a sort of philosophical sense it's important mm. even when i've been pre-wrecked in in like a stimulating moment i i've always sort of been careful to try and observe myself and and be aware of that moment mm. knowing how fleeting those moments can be those those memories and the collection you you acquire is often the inspiration to go on when you're not feeling so motivated so that's beautiful it's good you can have that perspective man you know you, you'll do a whole tour like this and you'll take back you know a few key moments where those things aligned and they're very difficult to uh, replicate yeah and they don't last very long i think that's quite interesting I, I, I mean, we, we were talking about coffee before, right? Right. There's that's if you over the more sort of you get into it, the more you're trying to like standardize the size of your particles and and brew time and all these sort of things and wait to get the perfect cup. But it's really what you're really going for is the taste of the first sip. Mm. That's the moment. After that, you're having a nice coffee. Right. But that is the peak of the experience, and that's to me that's when all the preparation was worth it. And you're looking forward to the rest of the cup, so it's the peak of the experience. Yeah, you have, you have the uh, the reward of the prep, the prep, and the the future to look forward to, without any fear. <laughs> you you haven't started worrying about it getting cold yet. Right. No one's interrupted you yet. <laughs> like so. Yeah, I love this metaphor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, I love it. Uh, so at that moment, that's that's the bit where you want to be. You want to turn on, in my opinion, your lucidity and and absorb that moment. Yeah. Collecting, like, collecting those is like collecting stars in Mario, I think. Yeah, you know, oh, through man. Through your life. Another great metaphor. <laughs> um, I, and I think that's what we keeps us coming back to, right? Like we're always just chasing another one of those moments. Yes, right? absolutely. I've, I don't see a huge differentiation personally from the coffee to the show experience or like I, I enjoy riding motorcycles, for example. And mm. there's certain, you'll do a whole day on track and you'll get, a couple of those moments where you you feel one with the vehicle, like you understand what you're doing. You're not just being flicked around. <laughs> yeah, um, you're not in imminent danger or <laughs> endangering someone else or just irritating someone by being slow. There's a certain moment where you feel like you're making progress, 
it's the it's the flow chart basically right. uh, position. It's interesting hearing you talk about motorcycles and the and the coffee. And earlier we're talking about you know drum and bass production. It, I, I'm seeing all this connection of like this very scientific sort of like nitty gritty process, all leading up to this, all in service of getting to like a very sort of primal moment that has nothing to do with. With science, you know what I mean? Yeah, perhaps so. Yeah. Yeah. You can uh, take any process and, and study it and improve it, right? So yeah. production was always a, that situation. I, I was trying to learn how to nail transient design or, or compression or uh, how to e EQ effectively. And over the years, you, you refine these processes. You learn that some of that process is down to your, your monitoring situation or your... AD conversion situation, your processor speed, like have you actually got the creative freedom to make decisions fast enough to stay interested and stay in flow? Mm. Um, are you hearing what you're actually making or are you hearing a distorted representation because of the shape of your room or the reflection? All these things are, are scientific processes that whittle down towards a better result. Right. Um, it's just interesting because I don't know that everyone who's in this industry in this world thinks about it in that way you know what kind of a, a a kid were you as far as like you know you were saying you're into computers what else were you doing with your time or even what did your parents do for that matter well i should first say i've i was very lucky to have extremely supportive and considerate parents they're both very scientific and uh lucid people for being such a odd kid i was given a lot of leeway mm. I think I probably worried them, but they dealt with it effectively. And I'm very grateful. Start with my mum. Most prominently, she worked in social services, mm. uh, specifically in child protection. Uh, before that, she, I remember she worked at a college and uh, she once worked at a, a small castle. A small castle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, was, that was pretty cool. <laughs> Doing what? I uh, like just the, the entrance desk. So, oh, okay. But, yeah. uh, I remember would visit the castle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes having to go, go there. It's uh, Rye House, it's called. You can look it up. It's right next to Rye House. Okay. Go-kart track, which is where Lewis Hamilton trained. Oh, shit. It's also from the same area. Okay. <laughs> but yes, social services, child protection. So she, uh, she always has had a strong influence on my uh, sort of humanitarian outlook, I sure, guess. Sure, yeah. Just uh, social psychology and, and how, how to treat other people, which right. is something I don't think I'm instinctually particularly strongly programmed with. Do you think you sort of picked it up? Because I think kids just pick up more from observing their parents than anything their parents actively try to yeah, teach them. Yeah, you know? I suppose it's it's not until I've got older and seen how much spectrum there is in other people's upbringing. Yeah. You, you take some, obviously you can only take it for granted because it's your only outlook. But having seen the range of how other people's parents are willing to behave in front of them or what they were willing to expose them to, my parents were, you know, just model examples moralistically, I think, mm. morally. My dad was an engineer. He was a motor vehicle engineer. He taught, he was an original engineer, then then he started teaching. And then he, he worked up to like, I think, head of department and was head of engineering, basically. So mm. I think he taught maths and physics or something as well. Oh, wow. He seemed to do a lot of people's jobs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I went to his retirement party and... It's funny, one of my regrets actually is not having a go at the other people there because I watched him. I remember getting up late at night because I was always making music and he'd always be like when I was trying to learn to right. live with them. And he'd be up, you know, to early hours in the morning slaving over things that it's, it seemed to me that other people should have been doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that work ethic, uh, both my parents' work ethic is very strong. Yeah. Getting a job done, doing it properly. And I mean, if for even what you've ended up doing now, I mean, isn't that, don't you do several jobs that, you know, could be assigned to other people? I feel like artists, especially in the field we're in, you almost have to be able to do, wear a bunch of different hats. You know what I mean? Yes, perhaps. I, again, as I think I mentioned a bit ago, differentiation isn't really, and segmenting these things isn't a necessary aspect to me. Hmm. Cre uh, Presentation, yes. Like I like segmenting my projects for presentation. Yeah. So come to a Phoebe show, this is what you're going to get. I like having a boundary for the project. I think that's an effective way of presenting an idea. 
But from my point of view, drawing a picture, doing the artwork and the music, why why do I need to say that those are different jobs? Right. I think we're, we're seeing now, it's not that difficult to make passable music. And yeah. it's not that difficult to put together a passable website or a passable flyer or, or do a lot of things in a passable fashion. Yeah. Technology will continue. And, and the internet as well, just the, the ease of education now. Like I've learned five years worth of information about coffee in the last two weeks <laughs> right? because I've watched direct streams from lectures of the best people in the world talking about it and presenting scientific graphs of of uh, extraction rates and sure. things from particle size, how many microns is necessary <laughs> and how many hours in the water and what temperature you can, that information would have been completely accessible, uh, unaccessible right. 10 years ago to me. And production is the same way now. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you're, you're seeing a 15 year old coming out of the gates at a, such a high level of production yeah. skill. It, it blows my mind now. If you look at the, the long term of that, Right now, it's still a novelty for a 15 year old to come out being great at production. When I was, you know, starting at 17, I was the youngest person anyone had ever met. (laughs) And everyone I met that was my age is now also doing what I do Mm. in the the same environment. Like all the drum bass people. Right. You know, people I would consider peers, really. So it was so rare that it seemed to nail it every time, you know, to be in that environment because you had, you had done your, your thousand hours, so to speak, at such a young age, you're already on the new wave. Yeah. Uh, now, I don't think that's necessarily a ticket to success or, or attention. It's true. I, agree. I think that's going to keep whittling down. Yeah. Yeah. I think people, uh, it's not a new idea anymore, right? To just be really good at production. Now, I think you have to have some other new idea. You have to stand out in a different way. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing for the the music scene in general that, you know, just being good at production may not be enough anymore. Well, but, you can you could just produce for someone else if that's your if that's your bag. And like, plenty the, of people is, are. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm trying to be fair with it. I, yeah, no, I mean, I'm not putting a value judgment on it. To me, I... I I, I think progress is going to happen and evolution is going to happen whether we're stoked about it or not. So, you know. Oh, no, I, I would put a value judgment on it. Okay. I, I, I don't think it's, personally, I'm not really that interested in, in you know, uni, in, in people that can just do one thing. Like, mm. it, it, to me, it's lazy at this point. Interesting. If, if, if you're expecting success in this environment, I'm watching some of my friends learn new skills all the time at such a rate. So many of these things are, are translatable skills to me. If you can edit in an audio editor, you can learn Premiere very, fairly fast. Sure. If you, if you know Premiere, you can probably use Ableton. Um, you can move from audio to video quite easily. Uh, maybe like hand skills and things, the things that are often lacking in these people's skill set, like b- being able to pick up a guitar or yeah, a piano or, or a pencil. Skills. Right. Yeah, mechanical <laughs> skill. Is probably the, the area that's exempt from this. Sure. But in the digital domain, I don't see the big issue. Like, I need a, why do you need a video guy? Alka is the very talented man who does a lot of the visuals for, for my teeth tour. He's doing things that I, I can't. Right. I, uh, there's a time limitation because I also do a lot of the other things. And then there's a point where I am unable to balance these many plates. So right. I bring him in and it's someone who's, who when I explain an idea to him, I know that it's going to enter his mind in an accurate way. He's good at translating how I speak, even though he's Dutch. <laughs> uh, and, and so we end up with a, with a congruous flow from what I want to see and, and his interpretation of that. Right. But if, if I had more time, if, if you know, this, I don't see it as, a, as an excuse. You know, you, know, I, you know, I'm just the music guy. Like, Sure. I don't think that's the case anymore. It's only going to be a matter of time before there are no, you know, someone will just take your place who isn't just a music guy. Right, so, right. And I think what you're saying too is that you don't look at what somebody else is doing and think, oh, well, that's, I, I, I'll never know how to do that. So I have to have them here. It's more that, you know, well, I'm over here doing this. So I need help, you know, putting this part of the yeah, vision in yeah, place. Yeah. If someone, I mean, normally if someone, if I see someone doing something that I don't know how to do, I'll already be looking it up on my phone. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that counts for everything, you know, whether I'm in a restaurant or, or driving somewhere or, you know, I just see something mechanically that I don't know how it was manufactured. I just mm. look it up. I, it pains me when I meet people who don't know how an engine works or a microwave functions or, 
an air conditioning unit works. Like, right. why don't you know that? How can you not? <laughs> like, how, the amount of people that can't describe a light bulb, you know, like how it functions and things like that, it's, it blows my mind. I don't know how you could be, you. It, to me, it would be a consistent state of distracted confusion. But you know you're talking about like the majority of people, right? That's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> That's it. Like just basic manufacturing processes or like to, to be able to, re- so many of us rely on these appliances all around us that we're sitting in a room filled with them. Right. There's so many different mechanical processes that produce the things around us and, and to, to rely on these things every day and pick them up and use them, take them for granted and yet not understand where they came from or, I don't know, that, I think that's, that's, that to me is pretty sad. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree with you, triggering. but then to, okay, so follow me here. To bring it back to music, there is something... I still like feeling like something is still magical. And I think about music, like the reason I got into music, the reason I love music is because of the sort of just the physical feeling it gave me, you know, and I still remember like songs I heard as a kid that would give me goosebumps or something like that. Name one. Uh, I mean, I started with Michael Jackson, man. Okay. Some of the classics. Right. Um, And then I moved on to, I don't know, punk and metal music, you know, like early... Green Day and uh, Sepultura and stuff like that. Uh But all like it was magical to me. And now that I produce music and can sort of see behind the curtain in the same way you're talking about, like understanding how a light bulb works, you know, now I can hear an album and think, oh, they must have recorded the drums this way. Or, oh, you know, they used this kind of processing on that snare. To me, like it did lose something in a way. You know what I mean? Like when when what you love becomes your career. And, and I, I don't know if you ever feel this way. Like there's a certain part of me that likes just being a fan of something. Like there's certain genres of music. I'm just a fan. Like I don't want to know too much about it. There's, uh, some of this is down to physical limitation. Like uh, understanding something and being proficient in it are, are two different things. Sure. And being proficient in something and being talented at it are two different things. Like, sure. I'm really interested in riding motorbikes fast, but I'm not talented at it. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I've at times been proficient, right. you know, but it takes continual practice and time. Understanding that and experiencing firsthand watching people who have a true talent for something that you do not possess, there's the magic. The difference. Sure. And that applies to music too. Yeah, that's true. I can spend, that that can happen in a studio where you watch someone use the same software as you and, and produce a completely different result in a way that you would never anticipated. Or it can happen with spending, you just pass your guitar to someone who makes it absolutely sing. Mm. You know, those are, those are all still magical moments. Yeah, that's true. I find I, I was having this discussion with someone the other day about it on a, on a sort of spiritual basis. I, I'm very much atheist and realist, and yeah, same. Um, to me, the beauty of existence is the impermanence, and and uh, hence attributing so much to lucidity and in individual yeah, moments. Being in those moments, really. yeah, knowing that things will go away is part of why you value them, and so attributing that, like understanding the mechanics of things, of how things function, doesn't remove the magic for me. The, the 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 temporary illusion of the moment is still fantastic. Mm. You can watch as I, I can watch as much behind the scenes footage of my favorite film as you know as is available, and still be just as enchanted when I watch the the, the final product. Sure, it, it, the experience changes over time when you know how I know how it was done or whatever, but it doesn't ruin it. Yeah, that's true. I think that's a, a totally fair point. And you're absolutely right that it doesn't change. I can see somebody do something and still be just as shocked, even if I know what tools they're using to do mm-hmm. it. it. It makes me think about sort of when you started on this journey with, with music as well. You know, you're talking about uh, 17, you were in your parents' house making music. Two questions. How did drum and bass and like electronic music come into your life? And how did you decide that it was something you wanted to be involved with uh, a classmate called Aaron Aaron Barber brought uh, the Prodigy Experience tape oh, into fuck, sh- into show and tell music one of my top five maybe top three albums of all time oh yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's a banger <laughs> yeah huge banger, <laughs> he brought yeah. a cassette in and played one of the tracks on that from what I can remember was it Experience or G- it's Experience I think into show and tell music which much to the chagrin of my music teacher who then <laughs> sort of by his own rule was forced to play it. Right. 
And I listened to that and was like, I've never heard anything like this. Uh, that's, that's stuck in my memory, clearly. Yeah. That's a very long time ago. Electronic music in the UK was getting, you know, some MTV and the VH1 stuff. I didn't have those channels at home, but I'd hear them in the morning on the way to school because I'd go and meet my mate. Yeah. We used to walk to school. I remember just hearing little snippets of things and being interested. And this is like mid-90s, late 90s? Yeah. Yeah. And then get, I, I remember buying, one of the first CDs I ever bought was Music for the Jewish Generation. I still got it. Amazing record. Yeah. And I inside, absolutely inside out. And um, so that was one aspect uh, and then a few years later, I, you know, I was listening to a lot of walk record stuff. I sort of just, with, with getting the internet in my household, I started sort of searching for weird electronic music and yeah. I ended up with like Square Pusher and Orteca and uh, Aphex, obviously, uh, Plaid, um, Wagon Christ, yeah. uh, all, all sorts of oddball stuff. It's probably a lot more I'm missing. There's so many. You yeah. got me trying to think of it. It was now. a super, super fun time of that leg of music, I think. And uh, I was just trying to ape that. I, I realized I could download a program that, where I could sequence notes. Mm. Um, and What be, program was it? Oh, well, FL Studio. Oh, there you go. Fruity Loops then. Yeah. Version 3, I think. Was nice. now on <laughs> 20. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that was that. Uh, it's sort of having a first, realizing that it was a way of being able to keep music whereas I'd grown up playing music as an impermanent activity mm. something that happens live and then stops right uh, with the exception of having cassettes and CDs so being able to like keep music in a new way was interesting I could change it I could edit it I could save it one day open it a day later and change it that was interesting in itself mm. uh, I, I took that to school burned it on a CD my friend was DJing local drum and bass shows he heard what I was making said it was weird electronic jazz and wasn't applicable to dance to <laughs> and if I made a few Martin Preedy by the way hello mate uh, <laughs> he was like if I come round we bunk off school I'll come round and I'll show you how to turn that into something that people will dance to yeah. instead of just get annoyed with <laughs> and uh Something that might, they might buy or or release to other people, right? Which sounded sort of exciting to me. It was the most exciting thing I think anyone had ever said to me, mm. especially because it was creatively based. And I'd already had a little bit of, of I'd been working freelance graphic design. I did some stuff for um, Microsoft and Xbox via a company in the US. Oh wow! Uh, for interface design, on even Photoshop. that young. Like how young are we talking? Here? Sixteen, seventeen. That's crazy. What I suppose that unlocked in my head looking back is that I could make money on the internet. Okay, yeah. And that I could make a lot more money than anyone in my life was telling me that I was going to make in 10 years if I stayed in school. Because everyone was like, oh yeah, well basically what you're going to do is you're going to do this, then you're going to stay on sixth form, then you're going to go to uni, and then the the machine's going to spit you out into a job that you'll like. Right. <laughs> Unless you fuck up, in which case it will spit you out earlier into a job you don't <laughs> like so much. That's, that's just how the human race operates. Yeah. So I was like, all right, that just sounds pretty shit. <laughs> I like drawing. <laughs> what am I going to do about this? So when I got some guy, you know, emailed me and was like, I like your website design that you've done. I would like to pay you, you know, a couple of thousand dollars to do some Photoshop work by two weeks time. I was like, that sounds better than a paper round to me. Yeah. So, and it worked. Everyone mm. thought I was full of shit. <laughs> I got an, an, I got a non-disclosure agreement from Microsoft because I got XP before it came out. Whoa, man! So because I, I had to work on the, some of the stuff, it was exciting. And yeah. then, uh, yeah, and then I actually got paid. I actually right. got the money. So uh, I already had this idea that this that there's no better thing to open a door in your mind than to actually get a reward. You know, the full the full cycle happened. Absolutely. So when someone else was like, if you try this, maybe we can sell a piece of music. I was like, well, I already believe that I can sell a piece of artwork. Right. And we already talked about how in your brain, it's sort of, it's a similar connected thing, right? Yeah. Well, because I, I suppose to me, it was already, already interesting that I could do artwork for the music. It was a one thing. I was I already had, uh, I used Spore as, as my um, drum and bass name. Uh, but the, I just got the name of uh, my friend Carl in Australia at the time had a piece of artwork that was called Spore. And mm. I just liked the word and it, it had sort of fungus elements to it and things and biomechanical influence. And then my other friend was into graffiti and he was like, if you're going to 
do graffiti normally four letters just for sort of dimension's sake. Right. Yeah. So I just took the E off. With it. Uh, yeah, so I I was already drawing all these parallels, I, I think. Uh, How did it evolve from there? Did it take off fairly quickly, you know, once you sort of saw that opening? And, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we used to hang around uh, in London, drive down in his mum's car, hand out CDs to DJs that I've now played with for years, mm. you know? sneak CDs into their bags. Yeah. My friend was extremely confident and social and uh, and cheeky as well. He had no problem. I was always amazed at his bravado with how he'd approach people and tell them that he was about to give them the best music they'd ever heard. <laughs> I um, love that. And man. that he demanded a phone call the next day to tell him <laughs> whether it was going to get signed. That was amazing. Um, I, I owe him a lot for that. I just stand there in the sort of shadows and watch this yeah. unfold. Yeah, I man. I mean, I had a very like gregarious center of attention friend when I was coming up in a slightly different mold, but it was sort of the same thing for me because, I mean, we talked about earlier, I never felt like, nor did I ever even want to be the center of attention or the life of the party, Mm -hmm. but I did want people to look at the stuff I was making and having him there as sort of a different kind of social lubricant, I guess, was hugely helpful to Mm -hmm. me in the early days. Yeah, that sounds very similar. Um, I learned most of like how to talk to people uh, online because mm. I had AOL Instant Messenger and yeah. I was in a bunch of uh, IRC chat rooms, sure, all, yeah. all based around uh, the beginnings of Deviant Art. Oh, interesting! Um, I think I was the eighty eightieth or eighty second member on that site. Whoa, that's uh, fucking crazy <laughs> for how big it is now. Yeah, I still have the account password. It's, it's oh man, one of the oldest. Records of me on the internet <laughs> re- re- registered in 2000 or 2001. That's so crazy. That's something like that. I, I, the guy who owned it at the time was Jark. I remember he like basically came in our IRC chat room and asked us one at a time to sign up because <laughs> he was trying to get it off the ground. Right. That's the site that got me a portfolio which allowed me to get the commission work. Okay. So it's all sort of placed. Uh, oh, amazing, man. His, uh, yeah, once the other. But pretty at uh, school. Um, and his confidence got our CDs out. And then we started getting phone calls back from we Andy C called us once at lunch break. Oh, I that, still remember that. that must have been insane. Yeah, super exciting. I remember my mate just running around in, in my living room, just sort of like showing me the phone number. I was like, it's Andy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh we yeah, so we had these little breadcrumbs of of encouragement and uh it started working. Uh Preedy went a much more academic route and became an accountant and now lives with his family in the US. Hmm. Very successful in his own way. But uh, when he left to do his academic education, it left me on my own. No longer, we, we started off as like a production duo and then hmm. he went. So it was like, I was sort of in for a penny, in for a pound. I thought, yeah. fuck it, I'll do it. I'll do it on my own then. And did you not go to university? I went. Okay. Yeah, in in body, if not in mind. Right. <laughs> did it start off, a couple tunes got picked up were you playing out locally i'm just curious how it evolved for you i had a few false starts i suppose i was looking back i think i was pretty resilient um you know you get i got a couple of things picked up and then not released that you know it's, it's, it was a fussy finicky scene and and things that mean a lot to you don't necessarily mean much to the person on of the course. other end it's, it's the difference between three releases this month or four or, or 10 or 11 <laughs> But you're hanging on the phone. Of course. So uh, a few things like that happened where it wasn't quite the full ticket. And uh, I got a track signed and then uh, the company that signed it went under. So then another company signed it, uh, Renegade Hardware signed it. Then the old company sued them anyway, tried to kick it. Oh, man. Just because they didn't like each other, I think. So and and then the computer I made that tune with got hit, the, we, the house got hit by lightning and it blew my computer up. Oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> yeah, so it's a real hard drive to try to recover because that that was my only all my music was gone. Oh God! Yeah, man. so it was a few things like that. Over time, it, it it got rolling, and I got given some good opportunities back then. Hardware put me on some of their shows at the end, which mm. is still some like strong memories because that was one of the clubs where I watched all my favorite DJs, and I got to play there. I got to play Fabric. Yeah, that's a special moment, man. I mean, even just being able to, you know, be on the other side of the booth at a place you've been going for so long. Yeah, I can remember that well. Definitely. 
just sort of uh, again very lucid moments. You know, like really yeah. focused in those moments. So that that was that. I started our, uh, started my own label with one of the workers at Renegade Hardware, which we had quite a lot of success with. And in that label, you started uh, connecting a lot, or at least putting out some records by a bunch of American artists as well, right? Or at least a few. Yeah, I suppose we. I just. Uh, just by chance, I got uh, some shows out here um, because of that link. Mm. The Renegade Hardware had Evil Intent and E1, and I was already a fan of a couple of American drum bass artists too, Hive and Gridlock. And it's just yeah. interesting because my perception as an outsider was that there was, uh, you know, a bit of a, a divide or, or maybe like a, a judgment call between like UK and US. Oh yeah, they were all American. Blokes still got a chip on their shoulder about that. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's hard to it's hard to uh, argue with it. It's, it's absolutely a thing, right? Definitely is. Like as as a Hertfordshire boy coming into London and sitting in a Vauxhall record label, like you know, you're just like this white teenage middle class kid perched in the corner. Hiding under a baseball cap, making music with computers. Everyone thought I was an idiot. Right. You know, was, <laughs> I, I used to get regular stick off this guy, Magic, because he didn't believe you could make a releasable piece of music with just a computer. Really? Every day. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and then one day I caught him installing a bunch of wearers plugins. <laughs> could hear the music coming out of his. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I got in sort of contact with that lot. And they sort of, I, I guess. Adopted me as a little brother role, yeah. really. I, I, when I was touring out here, I had no visa. I don't know if I was supposed to say shit like this, but I was like yeah, just cash know. in hand, sleeping on sofas, yeah. really, and, and uh, not particularly organized. Didn't really have a very well organized agent. It was all yeah. a bit of course. loose. <laughs> I mean, the whole scene was back then. Yeah, too. I remember like one of the gigs I played back then, I've still got a photo of it. It was like a. You know the sort of cinema signs where you clip the letters in. Right. It always reminded me of Spinal Tap looking back because it said Polish food and drum and bass. <laughs> <laughs> that was the sign for my show. <laughs> I wasn't even the first item. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the most important thing there was the was Polish, the Polish food. food. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and after that, then just the genre. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was. Just, yeah, exactly. There will be drum and bass while you eat this Polish food. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, some of those relationships ended up being very long lasting for you too, right? I mean, you mentioned like Ewan, who would be... Is, e E1. E1, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Jake, Kill the Noise. Yes. And uh, Evil Intent, who, you know, now Bro Safari, Treasure Fingers, Computer Club. Yes. People who would go on to sort of, I guess, move in parallel with your career and how you evolved, right? Yeah, Jake Jake sort of... Oh, Treasure Fingers was the sort of first thing, I think. Just we were all, I guess, independently coming to different crossroads. Yeah. Uh, but at a similar time, music, you, you, you know, the whole sort of plate shifting, you could feel it if you were involved. You could feel things were shifting. Influences for us were shifting. So, yeah, we all, we all moved along in different ways, but together. I, again, a group of people that are all still you know, part of my life and uh, I was very grateful. I got a lot of early guidance. Mm. I looked up to them, I still do. They gen genuinely looked after me as a sort of young English kid in the States, yeah. not really understanding how things work. It was uh, it was great to have somewhere you could, I used to, they were all in little five points in Atlanta a lot of the time, and uh, or at least even 10 were, and I'd see Jake when I saw him and stuff. But it felt like I've got so many memories in their house there, and it just it felt like a sort of second home environment mm. for me then. Yeah, I, I've had Nick on this show, and we talked a lot about those early days, and yeah, that kind of that family vibe. Mm. It, it's interesting to see how those connections carry over. And I, I did you sort of look to them as an example when everything was changing? You know, we mentioned at the point when you decided or sort of conceptualized the Feed Me project. What? How did you come to that? Like, what was happening around you? What was happening in your own life that you felt like you know th it's time to try something else? Uh, <laughs> just I, I guess like uh, I didn't mean that the way it sounded. No, no, no. I was, <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking about how I was going to how candid I was going to be about answering. I uh, I was the, I was running a label with my friends. I I made a track that I thought was going to be successful. I could feel something about it. He didn't agree. Uh, so I sent it out to another label. 
and they immediately called me back within minutes and it became my most successful drum and bass track. So I started to feel like I had a different idea about what I wanted to do and I was becoming more confident in my own ideas. Hmm. Then I got nominated. At <laughs> this this is sort of the petty side of the things that it's just these little hair triggers that add up, yeah. I suppose. But I got nominated for like best best single best DJ and best producer or something like that. I can't really remember. The Drum Bass Awards. And we were all really excited because we were an independent, totally independent label. Right. Basically a bedroom operation. So we went down there, booked a table at the event, which I had to fucking pay for. <laughs> and then got drunk, invited all my family and friends. And I won none of them. Of course. Of course. Standard. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I got Scorsese. <laughs> so uh, I just sort of, I was like, I don't know. I, the same people won that always win. Yeah. And, at least that's how I felt at the time. These might be emotional uh, memories rather than the reality. But, sure, sure, sure. Uh, at the time, I remember thinking, like, I'm, I'm not that happy about this. Yeah. In, in a, just, just a sort of environmental level. Uh, yes. I, I don't know if I really wanted to feel a, a part of it. It's, it's just, a, it's just the. Uh, sort of trinket value of, an, of a physical uh, yeah. trophy. I, I thought it was, I, I don't know why it sort of tickled me, the idea. I'd never been nominated or won anything. Sure. You, uh, like, you bought into it for a second? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, why not? Yeah, but, well, 100%. The modest answer is that I was lucky to be nominated. Right. And, and I, did, I do still value that in a way. But yeah, that, that was another little sort of small trigger. And then I was also, I realized I didn't have an awful lot of artistic outlet in the environment I was in. I, I could do this record sleeves, but it was very much by the numbers mm. and a bit under under rewarding, I suppose. You put a lot of you know effort into a sleeve, it just sort of goes down the production line, it comes out, people like it, and then on to the next one. Yeah. It didn't actually extend much into my brand. It wasn't a visual brand. Right. Uh, I had a logo. That was about it. Yeah. Uh, that was as far as you could take it. So I wanted to uh, be able to have more artistic expression with a project, something that uh, was closer to me rather yeah. than what someone else wanted out of the brand. So yeah, I uh, I started Feed Me. Feed Me to me is cool in that sense because it, it is a, a high concept project, right? On some level, even uh, I was reading something before I was coming to talk to you. You know, you were talking about sort of the the concept behind the the new album, High Street Creeps. Like there's there's if not a narrative there's at least sort of a, a theme to it right uh -huh. like behind the name you know you were sort of talking about like small town escapades right sure. yeah, something okay. like that and, and and i like the yeah, i'm gonna use that for the next album <laughs> yeah that's the new one small town escapades <laughs> stir, stir my life. that's pretty solid right yeah. <laughs> um but i like that it's a project that you can engage with sort of at whatever level you want to right like you can just listen to the music and enjoy Enjoy the music, but if you want to go deeper, there are those themes you can delve into. Yeah, perhaps. I like, I like sampling, for example, things that influence me, uh, films or, or media. Whether or not people identify the sample is often, you know, connected to how much they want to read in or, or are willing to read into the song or whether they just want it on superficial value. Right. But that's completely up to the listener, you know? Right. You can look at an abstract artwork and and see a nice looking pattern that just pleases you and then sometimes you'll walk up and see the description and realize that it was it was uh inspired or or uh, influenced by something horrible or tragic or something extremely with a lot of gravitas and then when you look at the picture again you have a slightly skewed or or, or expanded perception of why it exists yeah both both things are valid. Oh, absolutely. And as an artist too, it's interesting because you can make something with one intention and somebody else can have a totally different reaction. Yeah, that's the that's their prerogative, isn't it? I, absolutely. Yeah. That that um surrendering your artwork to the public is part of the process. Mm. It's theirs to interpret and it's not yours anymore. Uh I also feel that way about selling artwork really. You're you need to convince people why they should part with money to experience it, really. If they aren't convinced, they don't part with the money. And I don't think they necessarily need to. Mm. Uh, I still draw a line about whether it's free or not, because the, concept, the social concept of free is devaluing. We don't associate free access with uh, value. Right. Well, now free is almost expected, right? In a lot of senses. That might help over time. 
it's, it's just like if you, if you give something to someone and say, hey, have this free, they will take it and say, thanks, perhaps. But if you say, take this, it's free, it's actually worth a hundred bucks, but you can have it free. They'll probably look after it and less likely to leave it on the bus or That's something. That's true. So you're giving things value. That with music, I think, is also applicable. Mm. If you just, I've seen lots of people try and, you know, promote themselves by giving away EPs for free, giving away music for free, and just making that association is uh, subconsciously devaluing your music before they've listened to it because they got it for free. Mm. So why, you know, there's no effort involved on their part. There's no, there's no um, risk on their part. Right. They, they've, they're, they're completely empowered. You have no barring position and, and you've lost all your, all your weight. Uh, so I think uh, a lot of this is, is just psychological. But That's interesting though. That Do you think that attitude and that way of thinking, does that affect the way you write the music or present no, the music? Maybe present. I, hit, hit, I suppose my take on this is the Feed Me project is not just about the music. Right. Um, I'm trying to do a multifaceted thing here and I enjoy all aspects of it. And giving people different ways to experience it whether that's merchandise whether that's prints of my artwork or watching vi- clips of me drawing or or, or um uh experiencing you know like a three-dimensional structure sculpture show these are all ways that ultimately it's still the same project this is all under the same umbrella right uh, if you want to you know you can download all my music for free go for it buy a hat <laughs> yeah. You know, so I don't, I don't, care. again, I don't see the difference. Yeah, it's all the same. The people who are online very upset about how they're getting paid for their work tend to be people that are getting paid one way. Mm. And then, then you're reliant on the system. When YouTube moves its goalposts, which it does continuously, yes. streamers who focus, who are reliant on the system working one way, all suffer and all get upset. Yeah. I think surviving in the modern climate involves not relying on one system. And what's interesting about that, that I think about your project too, like we talked earlier about how you kind of had to make an initial upfront investment to have this big stage show, right? Yeah. And uh, Feed Me also has been an album project, right? You've got a couple albums under your belt, which I think is is a more extensive way of putting out music. Not every producer does that. So to me, it seems like there has to be on your end a certain level you know you put it on a certain level in order for people to accept it as you know an important piece of art with value uh, as opposed to sort of just running and gutting here's a single here's me playing some show yeah that's that's part of art isn't it but it's it's you um it's it is in in how it's presented and and how it's interpreted and uh the presentation of its art because I say so. If 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 you're willing to buy into that, then then uh, that's fine. Like that's valid. That is valid. So yeah, uh, creating your own. This is world building, isn't it? Really, I suppose. Yes. Trying to. Absolutely. I'm trying to create an environment here, and that's what I enjoy doing, and always did. Did you have the the concept for the whole world of it when you started the Feed Me project? Sort of. My original idea was to have like sort of like a Muppet band. Okay. So, of which Feed Me was one of the band. Yeah, I like that. Um, which is still something I draw sometimes. <laughs> it's not out the window. Right. It was just easier to refine. At, yeah. You know, at the time, one thing, do one thing well. Um, but yeah, that, that to me was, I didn't want to be the center of attention personally. I don't like having my photo taken. Mm. I don't see why anyone want to look at me. <laughs> so... I, I liked the idea of having a character that represented what I was doing. I felt like I could choose then how that was represented personally mm. and use my skill in doing so. So yeah, it was the world extended from that. I, I was like, what would go with this character? Well, and so I drew yeah, you these, could like, this I goes... things around him and they were like supposed to represent his thoughts, his sounds. Right. I mean, it's interesting. We were talking about like role playing earlier. And I mean, I feel like once you start thinking about, well, who is this character, then maybe it's easier to think about, oh, well, what would he do next? And kind of let that. If you want the existential answer, when you're saying that, when you're, when you're committing your life to a new project and when you're saying, who is this character? You're really saying, who am I? Yeah. And true. you're extending facets of your own personality into the character, which is what I was doing. He, he represented things I couldn't be, things I wanted to be. Hmm. It's the fight club principle, right? Does he still? Uh, yeah, well, I guess it's like, it's a creative expression without apprehension, uh, mischief, 
uh, and irony, mm. um, which are things I like. <laughs> yeah, kind of, me too, man, 100%. That did take off fairly quickly, right? From ter- In terms of like the the early music. Was it Dead Mouse who found the early tunes? Is that how that worked? Uh, to credit them and say thank you, uh, Noisier signed my first ever track. Oh, okay. Uh, technically. Around, right around the same, within weeks, they signed one. I put up a MySpace page, basically. Yeah. And put the tracks up with the artwork. I wanted the whole page to be themed again. Yeah. I wasn't trying to put up demos. I was trying to be like, this is little world. Yeah. Fully formed. Yeah. I, I loved that process. I still do. And like walking into a really well-decorated room, it, it feels already feels complete in somewhere that you can explore. So they signed one, oh, uh, more de moi. They signed that. And then I, I had the other demos up. And I think within a day or two, I got up, walked over the computer. I had a message from, from Joel Dead Mouse. I feel like I sound like a broken record because I've said this before somewhere recently. <laughs> I feel it feels weird. Um, but yeah, he messaged me. He was at Liverpool Street Station down by uh, the Andaz Hotel. He was like, come down, let's chat. I like these songs. I want to talk to you about them. Uh, I went down, spoke to him. He was, he had a label. I didn't know. Right. I didn't really know much about him. I spoke, to, uh, maybe I spoke to him once on like RRC oh, and I knew people that knew him because of some art groups that we've sure. both been involved in. He, he had like the Halicon handle before and I was Gooch Tech online. Okay. So we had like old internet people so he signed two of the tracks they came out his management company picked me up um gave me some remix work i dawdled on it a bit because at the same time i was still doing this drum and bass thing mm. and hanging on and eventually they gave me a bit of a you know get on with it or get yeah. out message and i had all these demos uh this uh, lad charlie was assigned to me to sort of help me put the demos together and we put together the um first ep which came out i think on christmas day <laughs> oh wow which was a sort of weird. A, yeah, I was going to say, that's a weird time for a release. Yeah, yeah. Where it, it just seemed like it was a bit of a sort of anti-everything idea, I suppose, to try that. And it worked. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it seems like it worked out pretty well. It was the big adventure of P. Um, it was great. Again, these are, you know, going back to the start of the conversation, like these little lucid moments, yeah. I have one very specific, I can remember where I was sitting, where I had the computer on my lap and who was around me yeah. when I was refreshing Beatport and I was watching my tracks go all the way up oh, man. the top of the thing. And all my family was celebrating Christmas around me. <laughs> and I was, you know, it's partly present, right. you know, but realizing that something really interesting was happening for mm. me at the same time. It's a cool memory again. Another yeah. one of those little it's like your own, Mario stars. <laughs> your own private Christmas there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's really cool, actually. And I mean, that's interesting too, right? Is that to start seeing success on a different level for, for a new project, right? Because you had uh, absolutely plenty of success mm-hmm. as Spore, but all of a sudden Feed Me happens and it's just, you know, a different dimension, right? Yes, how did you deal with that? Was that an odd thing? I'm Drinking. sure. Was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, a, a few different things, I guess, over time. I, it, it felt like an extremely rapid acceleration mm. and it had a big effect on how I behaved, my personality. In what way? I just started sort of becoming what I was describing. Yeah, I mean, like, the character a little yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I sort of lived, I was just living it and it was, I was, never really gone totally back the other way it was definitely irreversibly life-changing mm. uh, that acceleration because you become attuned to such a high level of stimulation doing a show you know just really really regularly limitless access to alcohol and people yeah just there's always someone to go out with party with get you to take take you somewhere do something keep me busy and then that back to back with Long periods of sitting very uncomfortably on planes in silence. Yeah, is the, the the polarity of that experience is is a stress on the psyche. I think mm. uh, over the eventually it sort of gets to you. Eventually, everybody. Oh, absolutely. At the time, it was fucking great. <laughs> Loved it. Break things, get drunk, <laughs> right. talk to girls, like have a good time. Have you managed to balance it out at this point? I mean, we talked about obviously, you know, you're not drinking. You're, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, watching your diet back to exercise all that kind of stuff but are you still able to kind of dabble in the more the wild stuff and just sort of have more of a sustainable balance of it pick your battles now yeah, yeah. I've, I've uh, I, I, you, you have to adapt constantly with the situation 
you know, the environment that's that's appropriate. And th- things were different then. I know it's easier, this cliche thing to say, but uh, you know, smashing up a backstage didn't seem like a bad thing to do. <laughs> and also, a lot of the time, it, it didn't seem to bother anyone because right. it went in it, hand in hand with the with the lunacy of what was happening with EDM here and. Mm. and the intensity of the parties. It was still underground and yeah, promoters and, and were still playing catch up exciting, rather than, right? Yeah. Yeah. Promoters were playing catch up rather than setting the precedent. It was it was like way out of everyone's expectations. Yeah. So you had this like real like punk uh period of it just being mad. Right. You know, police getting called to venues. <laughs> now it's become a well oiled corporate machine at a certain Oh yeah. Point. I mean it's interesting to think about like we're here in twenty nineteen, you're doing, you know, you've brought the teeth stage back out and feed me as a project has had this evolution musically uh personally we've talked about but at the same time the dance music scene as a whole has also been changing so much right sure and i guess i'm curious uh again two questions how do you see yourself fitting into the scene in general if at all and uh be has how the scene changed affected your development, either musically or in any other way you present the project? Um, I don't, and no. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't fit in. I don't want to either. If I, I, every time I have toyed with fitting a trend or, or doing something, in limited amounts, it's, it's fun. Yeah. Like seeing other people enjoy a new thing and getting involved a little bit yeah. is nice like that can be creatively stimulating watching watching other people and looking for new fun ideas yeah. of course and I mean most of my influence comes from outside music though to mm, be honest like you mentioned films yeah a lot of film visual stuff uh, storytelling mm. uh, games that's yeah. a fantastic area of media now but yeah gaming's like a huge oh, part yeah. of my life and, and influence yeah, so fitting in, specifically trying to fit in, I think it's creative suicide. Uh, just you just become bankrupt. I completely creatively agree. Bankrupt. Yeah. So uh, that would be a no. And has it influenced me? I couldn't say. I don't know how much of this is just me trying to improve yeah. in all aspects. I mean, do you pay attention to what's going on? Do you keep try to keep up with like, oh, this is a new sound. This is, you know, the hot. I, I I've whatever. been trying to ask this to someone else the other day. Uh, I don't without sound like a prick, but a lot of it doesn't really interest me. Yeah. I, I'll if there's someone I don't know DJ, and I'll go and check it out like, and have a listen. And every now and again, I'm I'm like, oh, this is great. We had an opener the other day. I was listening to. I enjoyed it. There was some cool stuff going on. They're playing guitar. They're singing and making an effort, and I appreciated that. You know, through Mousetrap, for example, I've met some talented people who've been. I've been lucky enough to come on tour with me. And there's there's whole new worlds of music constantly that I get. I, you know, my friends bring to me or expose me to, or we bump into. But in terms of like a scene, like yeah. what 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 you what I think you mean when you say that. <laughs> nah, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Like it's rubbish to me. Yeah. Like there's a lot of derivative music. There's a lot of repetitive and not in terms of the music specifically being repetitive, but the idea, repetitive ideas. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I think it's become quite one dimensional. The the way the shows are presented is one dimensional a lot of the time. It's now become, a, like I said, a strange sort of messiah complex experience where you mm. have this like LED box, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with a with a small deity <laughs> yeah. encapsulated within, yeah, and yeah. then a crowd faces that and sort of prays to it. <laughs> You're not wrong, man. <laughs> like there's uh, there's more than one. There's more. That's not the only way you can do a show, right? And no, I've, I preach a lot about I think how that, sick I am of the LED thing on here. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I got to be. I got to defend it a little bit. Like there's, we've got a few LEDs out there well, today. Absolutely, but, but well, I'm trying to make like a three dimensional thing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. They, I think it's a saturation point that that particular avenue. I want to watch another, like watching. I watched Zed on main stage at Ultra, and I was, it, it, what's, I was like, "What's going on? It's not really a live set. It's not really a DJ set." Yeah. He he's sort of narrating what he's doing on the mic. Uh, this is it's unfair just to pick on him, but this this structure is applicable yeah, yeah, like, yeah. across the board. Like, of course, I mean it's a it's a spectacle 
Um, yeah, that's all than, it was. Yeah. It's just a spectacle. I, d- I don't know if it was specifically making people focus on dancing. Right. I, I'm sure a lot of people there were having a good time, but whether they've been conditioned to enjoy that environment or whether they've been genuinely attracted to it is two different things as well. Yeah, uh, I, I completely agree. So yeah, uh, seeing, nah, not that interested. <laughs> I mean, did it ever, you know, not being interested in it and and having it sort of just have that boom and maybe go in a not great direction, did it ever start to bum you out? Because I mean, as Feed Me, you've taken breaks at certain points, right? Or step back. Yeah, I, I like... But like I said, I was doing it in an intensive fashion. I wasn't doing like half ass shows. It's getting, oh, absolutely. I, I live it. And uh, I, and I was, get, you know, doing a lot of sort of partying around it. Yeah. So it was draining. It's sure. tiring. It's hard. Uh, I never wanted to travel. And uh, now I've done more than most people I know, uh, which is so weird to say. <laughs> you know? uh, so yeah, like part of it's just just self-preservation. Mm. Uh, taking breaks and things but that's got nothing to do with this scene right I, I have no you know if people want to go to these big shows and and, and have a great time more power to them and, and people like Zed being able to perform in that way and, th- and that's how he's comfortable doing it then great good for him I'm not here um, to tell other people how they should behave yeah uh, my personal what you asked me is am I interested in it and, and the answer is not like right. that's just a dead end for me creatively I don't see anything I want from it I don't see anything uh, sort of that, that would benefit me creatively or, or influence me. Mm. It's just until something like I, I even it's just the idea of having an artist solo on stage with lots of people staring at them and uh, some in sort of colours moving around them is what is very bracketed to me. Right. Um, I, I'm interested to see like Stormzy just headlined Glastonbury in the UK. <laughs> Did Fuck you see it. any of the footage of that? Well, I'm just trying to find it. Yeah, I haven't had time. We just got off the bus. And yeah, yeah. I've been in between Wi-Fi, so I couldn't get the stream going. But there, you've got someone where he could have just gone up there and done this, and, you know. Um, but that's obviously clearly not what he did. Like, we do main stage Glasto, you have to expand on on your and, and yeah. put on a, a performance that appeals to a really very broad range of people, people that have never heard of you oh, and, ex- and are expecting you to uphold their expectations of what a main stage act should be at Glastonbury. Right. And it's, it seems clear by the response that he's he's done that in all different sorts of ways, not just not just musically, but culturally, politically, artistically. Right. Um, everything was considered and it, that must have taken an enormous effort, lots of great minds working with his great mind to produce. There's an example. So you can move these brackets. So the EDM scene, these brackets are not moving. Uh, I'm looking at the same thing a lot. So yeah, yeah, I yeah, you're absolutely right, man. And I'm I watched a couple clips that I found before bed last night, and whew, it's fucking crazy, man. Great. Yeah, I look yeah. forward to finding. <laughs> One of the last things I wanted to talk about was uh, the feed me as an album project, and uh, you know, you just dropped earlier this year the the second album, High Street Creeps. Mm-hmm. Was there something about this time? Was there something about what was going on with you, with the project, uh, that made you feel like the time was right to to do another album at this point? I wanted to do the album sooner. I just couldn't get my head around pulling it together stylistically, um, even in terms of like the mastering on it and stuff. I couldn't decide on a quite the right thing. I finished one track I finished Sleepless it was one of the, the I think third track on the album mm. I finished that and that set the framework for the other tracks once I had the sonic space down the rest came together really quickly and it, again another frustration I wish I'd sort of nailed that one earlier but I guess that's the the danger of having a more open-ended and sort of possibility endless kind of project right is that you're not always going to know exactly like oh i should write this kind of song yeah i i suppose i, I create my own problems by being anti-formulaic <laughs> so although i i, I mean i have I, I, i'm but sure that's also i definitely why you're you have longevity i think too oh thank you yeah i'm still here aren't i <laughs> still knocking around um yeah I, so yeah it just took a long time to pull that part of things together mm. uh but i do like doing albums I like the again storytelling in a way, yeah. creating a, a longer something you can put on and it moves up and down and takes you somewhere. Feels I like a good one. I think you know you sort of, it goes by quicker than you expected if you leave it on while you're cooking or something. And it, 
Ah, that's a cool way to think about it. Yeah. yeah um, I, the first album, I felt like I, it was over long. And I was trying to squeeze a lot in there. So I wanted to be, uh, you know, brevity being a solo bit and that, I wanted to be a bit more concise with this one. So mm. I cropped it down. I tried to get the ideas across faster, more efficiently, and still have character and, and translate my feelings, my personality. Yeah, yeah. I like that. That's like, uh, it's what we've been talking about this whole time of, you know, sort of tinkering with the process, optimizing little pieces, uh, even in terms of, you know, getting the ideas out more efficiently. Uh, I sound pretty robotic. No, I? no, not at all, man. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I, I love thinking about it in those terms. And uh, you're back on Mousetrap now, right? Which is must be sort of a full circle moment. For this one, yeah. yeah. It, just, it, it, it was the right fit. I like, it was been nice working with it again I toured with you know it's a couple of years I supported Joe on tour again and did a bunch of shows with him and then coming back to work with the label again was fun and it's I mean it's interesting because as Feed Me I think and correct me if I'm wrong but you don't uh, collaborate with a lot of people right and or, or not a lot of other producers nah, I should say really. and, and it's interesting when I look at the people you have worked with um not in terms of production, but I think about like uh, Dead Mouse or Kill the Noise, who you've put out some tunes with, and a few others. I never actually released anything with Joel. Right, yeah. I, 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 we sat in a studio, sort of, but I never actually finished anything. Sure, yeah. I more meant just sort of connected musically. Connect, yeah, yeah, uh, okay. That kind of thing. Um, is there something about, like, what attracts you to the people you do work with? Well, I, hopefully, I, I would say what should attract you, which is like, are you going to make a good piece of music? Like, is it beneficial? If I'm going to go in the studio with someone, I want to f- enjoy the company during the process. It should be fun. Yeah, and of it course. Should, and it should be more than the sum of its parts, uh, which is why me and Jake keep working together because it's fun. We challenge each other. We argue. <laughs> you know, like, I don't mind telling him if he's fucked, uh, taking the best bit out of the tune. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Put it back. And it's, he'll, he'll clap back at me or, or wait oh, till I'm sure. not in the room and, and remove it yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you have these battles, but these battles are are, are productive. They're moving things forward. Um, well, and I could see you now having talked to you for an hour, I, I could see you and Jake sort of connecting on a, a more philosophical level as well about music. About, yeah, well, that, that's a lot of our time is philosophical dis- discussion, you know, and and, and, and bouncing ideas of each other sort of existentially um then turning that into a song is is probably all our collaborations really he's one of my favorites man you want to talk about uh another uh, another guy who's great to party with too <laughs> and, and still have existential chats I, I think about nights i've had with jake you know very late at night when we've both had a few drinks and those are some of my favorite conversations maybe i've ever had <laughs> a lot i think uh, probably what all the like the evil intent squad and myself and jake all, you know all the drinking and the partying and the and the acting out it is it's basically sort of tonic and release for being trapped in the human condition. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's just trying to deal with with your existential nature. Like being able to fully let go. Yeah. And and being gifted a creative life where you're allowed to. That coupled with the fear of being a creative individual, the the risk, the the lack of future guarantee. Of course. Uh it makes for quite a volatile situation, especially when you're that age, you know. It's, yeah, well, and it's interesting. I Nothing mean, to lose. So, well, and it's that's perfect that you just said that because I was just about to bring up that you know Jake has a family now, right? And Nick has a family, and it's yeah. interesting to see the way they operate. Still, they're still doing the same thing, but now there's this other dimension, right? Now they're responsible for other people. Yes, both of them have individually given me the the. Uh, being a father changes your brain <laughs> chat, <laughs> which I, I have not argued with, I believe. Yeah, I believe that too. I don't have any kids. Uh, what about you? Is that something you ever see in the cards uh, for you? I don't know about that. Yeah. I'm already, I'm, uh, maybe a cat. I would like a cat. Oh, a cat. I have a cat. <laughs> They're great. I would recommend a cat. It will start there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, to be honest with you, man, the amount of time and energy and even money that I spend on that cat, it might as well be a kid. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, I, 
Maybe that's something I do when I get home, actually. Go to cat hunting. <laughs> well, not cat hunting, but... Yeah. It's a big <laughs> sack <laughs> on a stick <laughs> and a flashlight. <laughs> it's, I, it's life... Even that, for me, is life-changing. I'm a huge animal person. You want to talk about other hobbies, like another passion of mine is like wildlife conservation. Um, Honorable. Yeah, yeah, you know, I try. I, I can't help it, man. It's just like, I don't know. I feel very connected to animals for whatever reason. Well, we are animals, aren't we? Yeah, yeah true. How could you feel any anything but completely connected? Yeah, yeah. But then there are some people who feel more compassion than others, you know, for whatever reason. Sure. It's interesting, too, just like doing what we're doing. And I'll, I'll try to bring this home as best I'm able. But... Uh, you know, we are sort of operating as islands. Like I use that metaphor a lot. Like like each artist is our own little island. We talked earlier, you've sort of built this world for yourself. Uh, and for me, uh, doing music, making music, playing music to other people in particular has been a way for me to connect and feel connected to humanity in a way that I have not been able to just as a human. Um, I don't know if that is similar for you, but I do think about, you know, going down the line, like, can I expand that idea? Like, can I make other human connections outside of music? Do I have those tools now? I, I don't know. Like for you, do you see, you know, whether it's a family, whether it's just a cat, whether it's a new hobby, like has music allowed you to connect with people more than you were able to before? Yes, because, well, it's been my entire life. Like I'm starting to realize this is my life, you know, like it has been and it is. Yeah. Maybe that was more of it or, or at least maybe other people thought that about me before, but from a driver's perspective, not necessarily always the appearance. You know. Yeah. You can't always see how other people perceive it, you know? Watching people react to music I've made is interesting to me. And when I'm performing it and you play something you've made and, and that reaction happens, again, like the coffee, that's the moment when the, like the track drops or changes in a way that stimulates people, whether it's a vocal coming in and people sing it back to you or watching people, just that bit where they're grabbed by it and they act impulsively. That's when you know you've really connected with another human because they, they're they're acting on impulse. They're acting mm. without inhib inhibition. Yeah. And uh, they can't fake that. Yeah. The, that to me was interesting from the beginning with drum and bass too, just making tracks that, that people impulsively reacted to and realizing that that's what I wanted them to feel and that's how they felt. That's how I felt when I was making it. And that was me interpreting a feeling that something else made me feel. Is that's To me, that moment is the human connection. Yeah. Uh, Outside of that, like meeting people like after shows, for example, or something, and they tell you how, uh, like some people have said some really nice things on this tour about how the music's helped them through a difficult time or something. And that to me is almost overwhelming. Mm. Like, I don't, I've never really known how to respond to it other than to, to say thank you. Um, super humbling and difficult to process. Of course. But the easy part to process to me, the bit that keeps me going is just that little moment when it clicks when you're doing it. There's something really sort of pure about that one. So yeah, that that that's that, and I think that also applies to visual stuff too. Seeing people sort of gravitate towards your, your visual work or how, whatever media. Yeah, it's that's actually interesting. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap it up on this. Um, you know, Feed Me is sort of a it's a multidisciplinary project, right? We've talked about how to you the visuals, the music, the presentation, all of it is sort of under the same umbrella. Um, how do, how does an idea start? Like, can the kind of music you're writing be affected? Like, could that come from a visual? Could that come from something you draw? Could the, like, I'm curious, you know, sort of the core or the spark of an idea that then grows into this whole world. I'm starting to come to, to the conclusion that we don't ever have any original thought anyway, and we don't really make any free will decisions. So probably whatever I answer is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> when I pick up the pencil and draw something and think that I thought of it, it's still an assem assembly of influence that whether I knew it or not, yeah. assembled over the previous hours, months, years. And I'm just exerting that in a direction that I'm at that moment 
think I'm in control of. Mm. So it's all a big illusion. Yeah. <laughs> basically. <laughs> Whether or not you're willing to tap into that feeling and utilize it, I guess is you could argue is you can have that's your creative control. Sure. And and I think part of it too is like you have to in those creative moments you sort of have to fool yourself a little bit into whether it is an illusion or not, you sort of have to buy into it for that moment, right? And uh, and just sort of let go and let it be what it's going to be and not worry about where it's coming from, right? I would say the argument is for, again, for lucidity. Yeah. If you, if you accept the idea that you're just a conduit, then the quality of your output is going to be down to the quality of your input. And so if you're really listening and not just hearing, and if you're really looking and not just seeing, you're absorbing the moment, then when it comes to using those influences and projecting them creatively as a conduit, the output has more chance of being of quality. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll take that and talk, apply that to human relationships too, right? It's the <laughs> same thing. It's the same thing. If you're listening to other people, if you're in the moment, if you're active for them, if you're there with them, then those relationships are going to be better. Yeah, right? you're probably right. And I've broken my own rule by talking for more than 50% of this conversation. <laughs> oh no, this is the point. I wanted that to happen. <laughs> That's good, man. <laughs> this is not just a, a therapy session for me. <laughs> um, this has been really fantastic. Before we go, uh, is there anything else that's on your mind? Anything that's coming up for you? Anything we should talk about that we haven't? Uh, anything people should look out for? Anything else? Uh, my my album was out this year, High Street Creeps. You can go and listen to it if that's what you feel like doing to yourself. <laughs> to yourself. <laughs> uh, and I was, yeah, I'm Feed Me. You can Google me and look at me. <laughs> doing Great. this stuff. Great plug. <laughs> yeah, that's, I guess that's it. Thanks for listening. And thank you very much for having me on, by the no, way. No, thank been, you, man. It's been fun. Uh, I, I have to do this to you. I end the episode by asking the same question at the end of each one. And this is going to go back to these lucid moments. Um, just looking for one more lucid moment from you. Uh, a time in your life, and this is just off the top of your head, first thing that pops into your head, uh, just a time in your life, it could be recently, it could be from when you were a kid, any time when in a single moment, music really deeply affected you. And that's meant to be a really broad, you can interpret it as you want, sort of just the first thing that pops into your head. I'm going to give two. Okay. Uh, bringing home Kid A and sitting on my crappy uh, bunk bed thing. I just slept on this like metal bar sofa. It was fucking uncomfortable. <laughs> Sticking my headphones on in the dark and listening to Kid A over and over, just sort of in an insomnia fashion, mm. uh, was pretty mind bending. Uh, I, I can remember that as sticking out. Uh, my dad using Dear Friends by Queen as his alarm clock for years, hearing oh, that every wow. morning. It's a song uh, that I love because of that. Just gives me a good, strong memory connection. Yeah. Uh, that's beautiful. I, I have that. I used to wake up to certain songs when I was a kid and I can still hear those songs and still immediately I'm like right back in my childhood mm -hmm. bedroom. I, I love it when music gets tied to a time and place. And, and maybe, you know, you were talking about the, the effect people have told you that your music has had. I that's a beautiful thing, right? That you can sort of be a part of their moments now. Yeah, it's over, that's overwhelming. I'm still trying to work out what that means. I don't know that it has to mean anything. I just, uh, to me, man, that's just a, a beautiful thing that we can participate in that process, you know? It's definitely positive. Yeah, it's nice. I mean, it's it's flattering to hear. It's very nice. Absolutely. It makes, it makes an, an extra aspect, uh, aspect of why this is worthwhile. 100%. I, and I, it goes back to that human connection and it goes back to sort of what the music meant to us. And I don't know, man. I think that's a, a great full circle way to wrap it up. Oh, great. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, man. This was fun. Yeah, hell yeah. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. Peace. Right, that's the show shout out to feed me great to talk to you man for everybody out there listening i hope you enjoyed that as much as i did don't forget 
High Street Creeps, the new album from Feed Me is out right now. I'm going to put a link in the description of this episode where you can go check out all the new music. You can check out the next time he goes on tour. All of that in that link. Go follow Feed Me. My name is Willie Joy. You can also connect with me if you are so inclined. My email is backtobackpod at gmail.com or you can always hit me up on social media at Willie Joy or at Back to Back Pod. That's it for this week. That was a good one, man. I really had fun. And if you got this far, if you're still listening, I have a feeling you really dug it too. And on that note, I hope you have a great week. I hope you accomplish whatever you want to accomplish. And I will talk to you next Tuesday. I love you guys. Take care of yourselves. For Back to Back, this is Willie Joy. Peace. (laughs) 